welcome back to uh, the last session of this year's uh, Leon Cohn conference. Uh, just to repeat uh, what I forgot <laughs> when I uh, talked last time, what Jens Stoltenberg said was the lessons learned from the Ukraine, uh, the war in Ukraine so far was that one, and don't forget that, we have to spend more on defense. Second, uh, that uh, we must not be dependent on authoritarian states. And the third, that these states are finding together and cooperating more. And this is also what we are going to look at in the last panel, because the war in Ukraine is a tipping point. And we will discuss how this new geopolitical landscape, both at sea and land, uh, that this war will leave behind. The speakers of the panel is first Lars Nudrum. He is the deputy director of the Norwegian Intelligence Service. Uh, Lars became director of analysis at the Norwegian Intelligence Service in 2020 after 18 years in the Foreign Service. His last position there was as ambassador to Iran. Then we have Lieutenant General Arnebord Dahlhaug. He served as a senior manager in the OSCE Luhansk Monitoring Team in the Special Monitoring Mission to Ukraine in 2016-19. He has been the com commandant of the NATO Defense College in Rome, the Norwegian representative for the NATO Military Committee, and served as the chief of defense staff here in Norway. Give the two of them an applaud now. <laughs> Impressive, guys. Then we continue with Dr. Ian Bauer. He's an associate professor at the Institute for Military Operations at the Center for Joint Operation at the Royal Danish Defense College. He's an expert on sea power, deterrence, and multi-domain operations. He has also been by the Institute of Defense Studies here in Oslo. And last in the panel, we have Dr. Asle Toya. He's the deputy leader of the Norwegian uh, Nobel Committee, and he's the former research director at the Norwegian Nobel Institute in Oslo, and a good friend of the Atlantic Committee. This fabulous panel will be shared by Dr. Janne Holland matlari who will uh, moderate. She is a professor at the Department of Political Science at the University of Oslo and adjunct professor at the Norwegian Defense University College. Janne, please enter the podium. Uh, and we will start with the first uh, speech by Lars Nudrum. Please. Thank you. Can you, is it on? Yeah, excellent. Distinguished guests, um, among the large diversity of effects of the war in Ukraine is the intensifying of security dynamics in the Arctic, and thereby the potential for great power rivalry in the region. For Russia, the region's significance is increasing. With its conventional military power severely degraded, the relative importance of Russia's nuclear arsenal has grown. At the same time, NATO is in the process of admitting two new members, both of which are Arctic states. All the while, the dialogue between Russia and Western Arctic nations has stopped, and Russia's dependency on China is increasing. So today I'll touch on three topics, uh, Russia's Arctic strategy and China's part in that, the Northern Fleet and its strategic role, including threats to sea lines of communication, and finally, an outlook on what kind of Russia we may see in the Arctic in the years to come. Beginning with Russia's strategic outlook, the country has long sought to preserve the Arctic as a region characterized by low tension, detached from conflicts elsewhere. Lasting stability in the Arctic has served Russia well. Moscow has thus tried to balance strong national control with the need for international cooperation in the region. Russia officially 
acknowledges the need for international cooperation, but its distrust of the West is heightened. Because of Ukraine, Russia expects that rivalry with the West in the Arctic will increase. In addition, Northern Fleet land forces have suffered significant losses in Ukraine that will likely take years to rebuild. Even though airborne platforms have only suffered moderate losses and maritime assets remain intact, the result is greater Russian perceived vulnerability. The events of the past year have certainly informed Russian Arctic policy. In Russia's new maritime doctrine, the Arctic is described as a vital area, as opposed to simply important. This opens the door to a more active use of the military to protect Russian interests. Russia's recent legal proposal for governing the North, Northern Sea Route is another indicator that Moscow is poised to assert stronger control in the region. Furthermore, we have acknowledged that Finland and Sweden joining NATO is likely to reinforce Russia's view of the Arctic and Baltic Sea as one continuous theater for allied force projection against the country's northwest. Russia's, Russia's ability to reinforce its north, northwestern border will, with land forces in the near term is limited. At best, Russia could move some assets from other military districts in the mid to long term, Russia is likely to increase its offensive capabilities and infrastructure in the area. How this will happen depends on what lessons Russia will draw from Ukraine, as well as Finland and Sweden's role within the alliance. When it comes to Russia's economic development plans for the Arctic, most importantly, developing LNG production, building new icebreakers, and increasing freight traffic along the northern sea route, these remain ambitious. In order to secure technology and finances, Moscow will likely have to involve non-Western states to a great extent. This brings me to um, the role of China. <clears throat> Russia and China have maintained and in many respects reinforced their strategic partnership. The Chinese government shows interest in increasing economic cooperation in the Arctic. But so far, this has had limited effects. Moscow views Chinese Arctic ambitions with suspicion. For this reason, Russia hopes to balance its dependence on China by cultivating other partners. A substantial threat strengthening of Russia-Chinese Arctic relations is therefore unlikely in the short term, but this may certainly change in the future. As China is gaining more leverage with a weakened Russia. However, existing Russia-Chinese cooperation in the Arctic already has implications for NATO. Russia and China already share intelligence, possibly also on Arctic matters. In addition, Russia and Chinese, um, Russian and Chinese researchers conduct joint projects that may have military significance. I will now turn to the Northern Fleet. Um, the fleet has become more important to Moscow since the invasion of Ukraine. This is due to the fleet's key role in Russia's global deterrence against NATO. Uh, though the nuclear triad and particularly the strategic submarines based at the Kola Peninsula. As I mentioned, the Northern Fleet has suffered significant losses to its ground forces but impact on air and maritime assets has been limited. We consider the Northern Fleet's capability for <clears throat> strategic deterrence and operations against NATO to be fully intact. Before Russia's invasion of Ukraine, Northern Fleet assets were engaged in operations in the Black Sea and Eastern Mediterranean, near the UK and in the Atlantic. In addition, Russia's newest multi-role submarine, the Severodvinsk class, is seeing increased deployment. These vessels represent in particular impotent threat due to their endurance, stealth, and ability to carry modern weapons. They serve as a reminder of Russia's ability to threaten Atlantic lines of communication and hold land targets at risk in North America as well as in Europe. 
Norway is today the main supplier of pipeline gas to the European continent. For this reason, our national oil and gas infrastructure almost certainly represents a high-value target. The presence of Allied ships and aircraft in the North Sea is providing crucial protection and deterrence at this time. Norway, along with allies and partners, will continue to examine Norwegian pipelines and monitor all maritime activity. Um, finally, to, to look ahead, um, it is likely Moscow will still seize it in its interest to maintain low tension in the Arctic. Since the invasion of Ukraine, the Northern Fleet's responses to Allied activity have been measured and restrained. At the same time, Russia fears that the dynamics of war in Ukraine could spill over into the Arctic, impacting both national security and economic interests. Moreover, Russia is acutely aware of the coming effects of the receding Arctic ice cap. So far, the phenomenon has mainly represented economic opportunities, but it, also leading, it is also leading to the disappearance of what Russia has seen as natural buffers. Therefore, a more confrontational Russian approach towards NATO in the Arctic, including a more demonstrative show of military power, remains a distinct possibility. In the meantime, the High North will remain the staging ground from which the Northern Fleet will continue to show itself as the principal maritime threat to NATO. In the time ahead, Russia will continue to push the narrative that it is preeminent uh, that it is a preeminent Arctic state. Resuming an active role for Russia in the Arctic Council remains a key objective. At the same time, Russia may start looking for an alternative strategy to shore up support and legitimacy for its Arctic ambitions. This could lead Russia to grant China and other non-Western states a stronger foothold in the Arctic, thereby intensifying the global rivalry in the region. Thank you. Thank you very much. And that was uh, almost right on spot. 40, 40, 45 seconds left for your speaking time. I will give those to Arnebo Dahlhoek, uh, who will now utilize them uh, having the rostrum. Please, Arne. Excellencies, uh, friend, uh, and uh, thanks for um, the very nice introduction, Kat, of, um, of me for, uh, for the panel. Uh, <clears throat> of course, um, I will cover some of the same ground as the previous speaker, but I will probably have some different angles to some of those, um, those issues. But uh, I'm thinking pretty much along the same, um, same lines as was uh, spoken here a few minutes ago. And, uh, before I came here, I was thinking that my introduction probably would be too gloomy, but having heard all the previous ones, I consider myself to be quite optimistic. So let's see where we are heading. <laughs> anyway, for many years, you know, uh, Norway has claimed high north low tension. In reality, this has slowly been coming to an end over the last 10 to 15 years. Russia has remilitarized the Arctic, mainly along the northern sea route from the Kola Peninsula to the Bering Strait. Obviously, it's not up to Norway to decide the level of tension in the Arctic. This is mostly a consequence of Russian perception of its core interests and Moscow's aggression, both in the Arctic, in Europe and globally. And most important, the strategic nuclear balance between the US and Russia and the relationship between those two countries. Right now, the bilateral relationship with the US has hit rock bottom. Uh, Russia and the Arctic date back several hundred years. We have previously heard that uh, the Arctic mentality is strong in Russia, and uh, it is going back actually to the late 1500s, early 1600s. However, industrial activity is about 100 years old. Arctic territory make up the range of 25% of the Russian landmass and holds a disproportionately large part of the country's natural resources. Uh, 
About 20% of Russia's GDP comes from the Arctic area. Due to climate change and Russia's war against Ukraine, the future is more uncertain on these issues. During the Cold War, the Arctic played a huge role in the competition between the two superpowers and the US, the Soviet Union. The last three decades has been an exception, an interlude from the heavy hands of geopolitics. The Arctic Council worked well, climate change was viewed as a common challenge, and the future economic importance of this area was looked upon with great optimism. The repercussions of Putin's ill-advised war are felt all over the globe, including in the Arctic. Russia's war against Ukraine has ushered in a period of greater uncertainty and higher tension also in the Arctic, and most likely a long-lasting one. Nevertheless, the overall impression is that Russia's approach to the Arctic is still more of a continuum than a sudden change in strategy. And this reflects also on the maritime strategy and doctrine. After the Cold War and up to 24 February last year, the situation in the Arctic was to a lesser degree viewed through the prism of great power competition. This has now changed. There is no lack of Russia's official documents covering Moscow's thinking about the Arctic. In 2020, Putin signed the strategy for the development of the Arctic zone of the Russian Federation, and the present maritime doctrine, signed in August last year, is the third since the turn of the millennium. Basically, if you sum it up, it's all about two headlines, hard military power, less security, and economic interests. And Russia's war is not mentioned in the new doctrine, only indirectly, by saying a few words about the restrictions in the Montreux Agreement from 1936, which regulates the sailing route through the Bosporus. A third area worth mentioning is the lack of international understanding, as the Kremlins view it, of the legal delimitation of maritime spaces in the Arctic, especially related to the Northern Sea Route, which, in their strategic maritime thinking, connects the Atlantic to the Pacific. And fourthly, the doctrine, realistically enough, expresses concerns about access to technology and resourcing in general. Russia wants to be a great power with a navy to underpin this ambition. The maritime doctrine, as it was published in uh, August, sounds actually more aspirational than one rooted in realistic future budgets. The strategic picture of North right now, as mentioned before, the previous speaker, that three, at least three quarters of the land forces are sent to Ukraine and suffered heavy losses. Besides that, the ongoing activity is pretty much the same as it has been. There is no sign that Russia's militarization of the Arctic is slowing down. All kind of work on infrastructure is still ongoing, and so are other activities. Russia's strategic interest in the Arctic has not changed much since 24 February last year. Still, it is to defend its second strike capability, to defend the homeland. Russia has also offensive ambitions like to project power into the North Atlantic. In the NATO strategic concept, it's labeled as a strategic challenge to the alliance. However, if we look to the future, we should expect the Russians, at least every now and then, to do some strategic analysis, much in the same way as we do. The reality is that Russia's strategic position, regionally and globally, has been cons considerably diminished by its aggressive war against Ukraine. Likely strategic changes all point to the Kola Peninsula and the areas up north taking on and expanded importance to Russia. The enlargement of NATO with two new Nordic members will move the alliance center of gravity more to the north, and the Baltic Sea will more or less become a NATO lake. The uncertain future of the Black Sea, of course caused by Russia itself, points to the decreasing value of the Sevastopol naval base. If we look to the Russian Pacific fleet, the strategic situation also there is deteriorating seen from Moscow. The US is getting extended access to bases 
and Japan has launched an unprecedented military buildup thanks to the aggressive behavior of just Russia and China, which of course will lessen the effectiveness of the Pacific fleet in any future confrontation. As previous uh, speakers have mentioned, we should expect a growing strategic importance of the role of nuclear weapons in the year to come, seen from Moscow. Whatever will be left of Russia's influence as a kind of great power will be based primarily on these nuclear weapons. The New START agreement will expire in 2026. The negotiations between the US and Russia about strategic nuclear weapons are in trouble. In three years' time, we could see a world without any active treaty related to nuclear weapons. Maybe Russia should hurry up and actually write a new maritime doctrine based on these new realities. A new realistic doctrine should reflect the negative consequences of Russia's war against Ukraine and a much reduced resource base. This time, my prediction will be that the Arctic and the Peninsula will be described as even more important than in the latest military doctrine. The era of naivety is now behind us. Russia's war against Ukraine has breathed life into a new geopolitical and security thinking globally. This will be with us for many years to come. Obviously, also the Arctic will be affected. On this happy note, thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you very much indeed. We're saving uh, seconds here, one minute even. Extra one minute for you, Dr. Bowers. Uh, please uh, take the floor if you can uh, release yourself from the <laughs> audience. <laughs> Thank you. Can you hear me? It's still working? Yeah? Okay. Uh, so first of all, thank you so much for inviting me here. Uh, I'm an Irishman living in Denmark, but I consider Oslo my second home, and uh, it's, 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 it's very good to be here. So uh, asking or being asked to talk about the future of sea power and naval rivalry is always difficult, and it's particularly difficult when you follow such a good panel that we heard earlier on today, which actually covered nearly everything I was going to talk about. So. I will I'll try and build on some of the themes that, that we heard about uh, uh, in this morning's session. And the first thing I really want to talk about is, is sea power itself. And what we heard about today was a lot about navies. But in reality, sea power is so much more than that. In an academic sense, sea power can cover everything from maritime shipping, fishing boats, pipelines, energy infrastructure, port facilities. But let's just zone in on a military sense of, uh, side, side of things. Navies are obviously probably the primary component of sea power, but also you have air forces, you have armies, you have cyber, and in some ways you have key enablers like space. And I think this is a very relevant part of the discussion. Now, this is not anything new. In history, navies have always engaged with land defenses. The old adage of ships don't fight forts is probably still somewhat relevant today but it's worth pointing out that Ukraine sunk the Moskva not with a navy, but with a land asset. And this is very, very relevant for us as we move forward. And I would argue it's becoming even more relevant because the operational concepts that NATO is developing, or more importantly, the United States is developing, and China is developing, do not solely rely on navies, but rely on a much more enhanced version of joint warfare than we've ever seen before. Now, in the, in the US, they have lots of fancy names for this. One is joint all-domain operations, another one is multi-domain operations. In NATO, it's going to be multi-domain operations, we think. But in effect, what this means is that our old ideas of sea control and sea de denial might not be so relevant anymore. So we heard the idea that we need to control the maritime approaches in the North Atlantic. What does that actually look like if Russia or China in the future can reach out with a cyber effect and take down your vessel or make it or mission kill it. Or Russia in some stage in the future, if they reconstitute their force and develop the capabilities to do what they say they could do, 
can, can reach out and strike a ship from 2,000 kilometers away. So all of a sudden, sea control is no longer this guaranteed state, but a state that we have to consider in a much more holistic fashion. So I think this is, this is a point we, we can't really, really ignore. The second element of this is that due to technology, uh, the offense right now has the advantage. So at sea, the defense is much harder than offense. Intercepting incoming missiles and things like that is very, very difficult. Different, difficult. And as we move forward, looking 5, 10, 15 years in the future, it will probably remain as difficult. Now, throughout history, there has always been a response to some offensive capability, but right now, the offensive capabilities seem to be moving faster than the defensive capabilities. Another implication of this kind of operational concept for all of us is that we require much greater interconnectivity between assets, so naval forces or joint forces within a state and on a combined level as well. And unfortunately, NATO is not particularly good at this. States aren't great at joint warfare, and NATO is not particularly good at combining joint warfare together. The technology exists, but what does not exist is the political will to overcome national caveats, data sharing, and all of these other elements that's required to effectively or maximize the effects that we can create. And what we are beginning to see instead is a kind of bifurcation or separation where certain states are embraced and other states are left behind. So the Five Eyes states will inevitably be more advanced and more cooperation than other NATO states. And you might even see more ad hoc groupings as we advance in the future. And we see this particularly in Asia, where it's really India, Australia, and Japan is coming on board at a greater degree. And the US is beginning to trust them more with data. So NATO countries face very hard choices when it comes to, uh, when it comes to you know, sharing data, giving control to the US, how much do we give, how much can we, we force multiply. So I think this is an extremely important element that we have to consider as we move forward. The next important element is something we can't forget, is ships sink. Now right now, the European navies are in a relatively parlous state. We do not have a lot of mass, and mass is very, very important. It's important for two reasons. The first one, ships sink. The second one, as the Russian invasion of Ukraine has shown, is to create effect on land, you need a lot of firepower. And NATO navies do not have that at the moment. Our ability to strike the land is extremely weak. So we need new vessels, new capabilities to do that. And it's not a case of saying, we'll put four Tomahawk missiles on a ship. We'll need a lot more to be able to, to, be able to create the effects that we're seeking to create. And if ships can sink, the, the lead on from that is that they cannot be easily replaced anymore. Building ships is expensive and it is extremely slow. And Western countries, including the US, shipbuilding capacities are at an all-time low. And this is an extremely dangerous situation for all of us right now. If you think about the AUKUS debate, and now AUKUS is an important, is an important element uh, and, and has lots of benefits, we're talking about a time frame of perhaps having submarines, Australian nuclear submarines, by 2040. Now this is to deter China. But in an era of naval rivalry, deterrence is not a static process, it's dynamic. And China has plenty of capacity to respond between now and 2040. So in an era of deterrence, or dynamism in deterrence, or extreme naval rivalry, we have to consider, uh, we have to consider how we can improve our procurement, our shipbuilding, our ship maintenance. And these are key questions as we look to the future of sea power. Just to, to, as, to an add-on, U.S. submarine maintenance is about 10 years behind schedule right now. And another submarine facility went offline last week uh, because of, of, of issues of potential flooding. So I think you know, these are questions that we have to look into uh, and, uh, and, and examine closely. So if these are the issues of sea power, we then have to talk a little bit about what this naval rivalry looks like. Why should we care about this? And the problem is previous naval rivalries have nearly always tended to end up as a precursor to some sort of conflict. Anglo-German naval rivalry, 
stopped a year before World War I, what was a precursor, a signal of what was coming. And before that, you had numerous naval rivalries that all resulted or nearly resulted in conflict. And what you're seeing in Asia in particular is a massive Chinese naval buildup. And what that looks like is essentially the Chinese Navy is building about a small European Navy a year and deploying it, roughly, maybe a bit more. And I know we've heard warnings we don't know the quality of that, but I would say in 1904, the Russians questioned the quality of the Japanese and got it handed to them in 1905. In 1939, the Americans questioned the quality of the Japanese and got beaten. In 19, uh, 1950, the Americans questioned the qualities of the Chinese and forced fought to a standstill in Korea. So there is a lot of evidence that we tend to underestimate what's going on in the other side of the world. And, and we should be very careful that we don't do that again. Um, so so that, is, that is one element that we have to consider. The second element is that we are essentially seeing two competing warfighting systems clashing with each other. So on the Chinese side, they are building a combined joint force, and they're still working on it, where they can credibly connect land-based missiles, surface fleet, subsurface fleet, and air cap cap capabilities, ostensibly designed to blunt US power projection. In competition with that, the US is developing all of these operational concepts to penetrate this bubble, to be able to operate in contested seas. So perhaps counting ships is not always the optimal way of, of achieving or examining uh, naval rivalry, but what is happening is a competition of philosophies of operational concepts. As we move forward and China becomes more powerful and has a bigger fleet, we might then see them beginning to stretch out and have global influence. But we should be very careful of mirroring our own beliefs about how sea power works onto an adversary that might not exactly have them. He doesn't have to read Mahan to know what, you know, how navies work. And what does this mean for Europe? We've heard a lot about Russian capabilities right now, so I'm not going to go over them too much, other than to say Russia-China cooperation is an interesting thing. How it's worked in Asia is not exactly like sophisticated exercises, but we have seen coordinated movements. In particular, we have seen Russia and China so, yeah, Russia and China jointly challenging Japanese claims around uh, their, their contested islands. We have also seen Russia and China, you know, challenging South Korean control of their air defense identification zone using maritime patrol aircraft. And in 2019, that resulted in South Korea firing, firing warning shots across the front of a Russian aircraft and being criticized for it as being unduly escalatory. The Russians have not done that since, though. So I think we need to look at that lesson to see where that cooperation is going. And I'll leave it at this, or these two thoughts. Inevitably, even if Russia's navy is weak, their air power is still in existence, and in the next 5 to 10, 15 years, it's highly likely we will see a Chinese fleet operating in Europe. And how NATO manages that scenario is something we really need to consider as we move forward. And with that, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you. This is getting uh, more and more nerve-wracking. Chinese fleet in Europe. Uh, we are always praising the freedom of the seas, and uh, duly so. But uh, that, of course, will also mean openness in, uh, in our waters. Asle Toye, you are known to be the perennial optimist, believe, believing in the survival of the liberal cooperative order. So I hope you will now in lighten us up at the end here, or maybe I'm wrong. Uh, but here is the larger geopolitical implications of it all. Please, Atle. Well, Prof Professor Holland Atlari, you might be wrong this one time. Dear friends, for decades, for a great many years, we have been assembled here at Leankol to discuss the challenges for the transatlantic alliance. This is one of the great strengths of uh, the Western powers, our capacity to acknowledge our mistakes, to deal with the, with the tensions within the alliance, and, and to hopefully do better. And, and let's be honest, uh, for a great many of these years, uh, at Leoncoln, we have been talking about NATO being in crisis, 
because NATO is always in crisis. And we have been looking for change in periods characterized by continuity, like during the Cold War. Now we have change, and unsurprisingly, a great many people would argue that we are seeing continuity. I have been asked uh, to come with some comments on the future of great power politics and its effects on the trans uh, transatlantic alliance. Interestingly, one of the great or most popular terms these days is the concept of geopolitics. It was coined by a Swedish scholar, Rudolf Schelen, in his four-volume book, The Great Powers, that was published from 1910 to 1914. I believe that much of the scholarship that was carried out in the past era of multipolarity may be of some relevance for where we are now. One of the key lessons from Rudolf Schelen's work is one that very few scholars have since revisited. Whilst most scholars are most concerned with the rising powers of this age, the Chinas, if you will, Rudolf Schelen was always more, uh, was always more worried about the declining powers. Uh, and in our case, the declining power is Russia. In 1914, a, a scholar called Thomas Hardy wrote a book called The Breaking of Nations. Well, friends, Russia is in the process of breaking itself over Ukraine. I don't think that this would translate into any immediate military full-scale defeat for Russia, but let it be clear, invading Ukraine is probably uh, the greatest mistake in modern Russian history. And the Russians are just now coming to terms with a proclivity, if you will, when it comes to Western powers. Once lines have been crossed, once we are engaged, we're locked into confrontation, we do not give in. And for those in Russia who are dreaming that a change of power in Washington DC or in any other European capital would change the, uh, the, the sanctions and the confrontational behavior from the Western powers meant for Russia to get Russia to pull out of Ukraine, if they think that is going to end, it won't. But let's also look at our own situation. I think that there are a great uh, many commentators in the West who are maybe a little bit similar to audiences at the time when Rudolf Schelen was writing his book. This was, after all, the age of the cult of the offensive. And right now, all around Europe, People are playing their own sort of board games in terms of what weapons should be given to Ukraine. Should we give them tanks? Should we give them fighter aircraft? In the assumption that this will lead to a great a grand offensive where the Ukrainians will break through the Russian defenses and the Russians will somehow end up waving the white flag. Similarly in Russia, they're preparing for their own offensive. Uh, it's probably going to be big and loud and it probably won't get them where they were hoping to go. Uh, I think that the most likely scenario for 2023 is that there is not going to be any end to the war in Ukraine. I'm afraid this might end up being a war that is going to be rather long, rather loud and quite expensive, not unlike a German opera. In the 1950s, there was a great uh, m uh, amount of interest among scholars as to the workings of multipolar systems. I thought that might be interesting since we are delving into a world where there are more than one or two power centers, uh, one with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with three, four, five. J. Alfred Singer was a great scholar who wrote about this in the 1950s. He argued that a multipolar system needs five power centers in order to be stable. Uh, and from this theory, I think we can understand some of the turmoil and instability that we see in the world today. So what are we seeing? Well, the first of all is that the wedge that was inserted by President Nixon and Henry Kissinger between China and Russia, well, that has slipped. China is now, according to American sources, actively sanctions busting and supporting the Russian military effort in Ukraine, uh, actively seeking a much closer relationship between the two powers than has been the case in the past. I'm not saying that's good or bad, I'm just saying that it has happened. At the same time, President 
uh, Joe Biden has reinvented an idea from 2008, John McCain's presidential bid, where his centerpiece for his foreign policy was what he called the League of Democracies, where he sought to bring the democracies of NATO together with the alliance system in Asia. Uh, we all saw uh, Jens Stoltenberg, the NATO Secretary General, visit uh, Tokyo uh, with some quite uh, bellicose language directed at China. It would seem that the democracies of this world are trying to get our act together in a grander, in a grander scale. So, we're moving towards a more global NATO. It was interesting to see in the new strategic concept that uh, from mentioning China zero times in 2010, the new strategic concept mentions China nine times, which is quite an increase. And it seems that NATO will be taking on a more global role. And being Westerners, we have a tendency to assume that that's going to be fine. If there is one mantra to the, for the Western powers, it's the assumption that we will prevail in the end. And that might very well be the case. All I'm saying here is that it's not going to be as easy as some people seem to assume. Carla J. Holsti uh, wrote one of the sort of basic textbooks for uh, political science. And to the big questions, what do states want? What do great powers want? He said they want four things. They want security, they want autonomy, they want wealth, and they want prestige. So when we look at the, uh, a power audit of sorts between the West and the rest. I think that the war in Ukraine has illustrated that Western armaments, Western weapons, are by far more advanced than anything else that any other power can put against us. And I think that this must have been a shock in Beijing and certainly in Russia to see how badly their technology holds up against Western technology on the battlefield. So when it comes to security, the Western powers uh, are now benefiting from what were, was seen as, excess, as excessive American defense spending throughout the post-Cold War period. When it comes to autonomy, I think it's interesting to see that the European states are now probably more dependent on the United States than they have ever been in the history of NATO. For many years, there was a discussion between the power sharing and the burden sharing within the alliance. For many years, the Americans spent much time consulting with the European allies, and the trend has now become more that the Americans inform their in European allies through the news media, much as the rest of the world. Uh, the Americans are now uh, by far the leader of the Western alliance, and it's interesting to see how many uh, uh, European countries are just tagging along, for instance, when it came to the German uh, being pressured into handing over Leopard tanks. I'm going to end up by talking about the more sort of depressing sides of this, and that's the economy and the prestige. This is something we need to take turns with. Over 100 countries in the world are not supporting the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the sanctions against Russia, and the Western powers seem to be completely unwilling to accept that the lack of prestige is a problem for Western countries. Being powerful is like being a lady. If you have to tell other people you are, then you're probably not, Margaret Thatcher said. An essential part of being powerful is to be taken into consideration without having to ask for, for it. And many countries are now not following the West. I would posit that might have something to do with our own savage wars of, of peace that has destroyed much of our credibility when it comes to criticizing other countries for uh, breaking the sovereignties of, uh, of countries such as Ukraine, something to, that we might want to revisit. Uh, I think it might be necessary to build a stronger alliance. And finally, when it comes to the economy, we are seeing a great redistribution of economic power in the world today. Russia and China, uh, now United States and China are roughly on par. According to PricewaterhouseCooper, China, uh, India will be the greatest uh, economy of the world by 2050. So we're seeing much more distribution when it comes to economic muscles. Dear friends, we are now in a new situation. 
For the longest time, if I'd been on this podium, I would be talking about the potential for a liberal world order, the world order promised to us by Francis Fukuyama and others, a world where we would agree on the basic rules and move forward together. Uh, in the year that has passed, we've seen a great shift and one that I think will be difficult to reverse towards, comp uh, towards great power competition and towards growing animosity amongst the great powers. Some say that that might lead to war. I don't think so, not in the short term, not after the, uh, the Russians have gotten such a bloody nose in Ukraine. But certainly, I would say that it's likely that we will see ever stronger competition between the West and the rest. And I think that the tre trend towards consolidation within the West will continue abreast. And I fear that we will be discussing that NATO will be in crisis, yeah. as we always have, but I think that we will have uh, uh, a greater chance of discussing change and setbacks in the years to come. Dear friends, the world is now more dangerous. Choices have been made. We will now live with the consequences of these choices. We are now in a new phase of great power rivalry, and it's not certain that we will win. We will have to make it an effort for this one. Dear friends, those were my, my remarks. Thank you so much. Thank you very much indeed. And um, this panel, in a way, has, if you look at the heading of this panel, it's Ukraine, the future of transatlantic security and great power rivalry, and then also including the Arctic. So this is a bit like a course that was given at the University of Minnesota in 1812, <laughs> named A Survey of All Knowledge. <laughs> However, uh, we shall now, in the next uh, 45 minutes, try to decipher and uh, devise some solutions. And I'm then thinking about strategy. Uh, we have the diagnosis. Uh, there are, uh, there's a storm, Kenneth Braithwaite said. There's a storm looming. One has to reef the sails. Um, I am uh, going to ask you and discuss with you uh, strategic options for the West, because if if we're going to win this one to prevail, uh, then there has to be some kind of win in Ukraine. There also has to be a strategy for the time thereafter. Uh, and uh, it seems that there's very little uh, strategic thinking. If the West now depends on being able to wield power, economic, military, hard power in Europe, which has been a strange idea to many states for a long time, then there has to be a strategic direction to that use of power. And I think the lack of strategic planning uh, for Ukraine is quite obvious. We see very little discussion of the end state that is desired. And indeed, uh, the weapons delivery itself uh, is in a way constrained by a fear of escalation that is not discussed very much either. One could make the argument that uh, Bing West, for instance, makes that if Ukraine is going to win, then it has to, it can't have one hand tied on, on, on the back. It must be able to strike targets in Russia. It must have long range artillery, must have airplanes. Uh, otherwise, it's a futile exercise. Uh, so I would like to, uh, to ask you about, I, I'm afraid that the assumptions we now make are quite easily made, optimistically made, that if we give some tanks, we give some, uh, some uh, even planes, the battle is won. Uh, and uh, indeed, there seems to be a change of strategy in giving main battle tanks one intends to win. And this is stated from American sources, um, American policymakers, yet it's half-hearted. It's as if we're still in the King of Sicily mode. The King of Sicily refused uh, to send a reinforcement to the Knights of Malta in 1565 when they were uh, besieged until the king knew who would win. And once the, Mal the Maltese Knights had won, 
the reinforcements arrived. And that was a strategy for the king that was sensible because he needed his own troops should he have to defend Sicily. And likewise, the Western strategy seems to be a bit like this. We will uh, give them something and see what happens, hoping that they will win. Yet now it seems necessary, given the time factor, that they should indeed win. But is there a strategic will and planning for this? And should there be? So I will have a round here. This is, of course, the uh, extremely difficult question, but uh, it's a very central one. We can all start with the Norwegian e-intelligence. Uh, what's your personal, I suppose, uh, <laughs> thinking about this question? Well, <clears throat> I think what many of the speakers touched on, and what you touched on, is um, uh, Ukraine is, is we're in it for a long haul. It, it's, it's going to be um, uh, a long endeavor. Uh, Providing Ukraine with munitions is critical. Um, they have no capacity to produce their own munitions anymore. So uh, what I would say is we're sort of in a race here. So a race for how long will the Western willingness to keep up uh, providing munitions to, to Ukraine last versus Russia's willingness to take enormous losses on the battlefield. Um, so that is really the key question, and um, so far Western uh, resolve is, is very, very strong, and uh, I think Russia has been surprised by how strong mm -hmm. that resolve has been, and uh, uh, you mentioned uh, one arm being tied behind the back. I, I think a different angle on that would be to see where we are now compared to where we were 11 months ago, it, it's been a tremendous development in, in terms of giving more um, powerful weaponry to, to the mm -hmm. Ukrainians. So I, I think um, um, it, it's, it's a long game and we need to plan for, for, um, uh, for the long haul. That being said, the, the war cannot continue at the current intensity for, for much longer. We, we do see that even uh, Soviet area stockpiles of munitions have limits um, so the war will have to change its, its shape um, in the coming uh, months and, and uh, year. Yep. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, what's your view on this, Arne? You are familiar with the terrain on the ground. Mm -hmm. Well, Jan, I do love questions that uh, open up the possibility for a new uh, book project, of course, <laughs> for a long, long lecture. But uh, for, sure, for sure, I do have uh, have views on uh, on these uh, these issues, and I just made a quick uh, quick note. And uh, one one of the issues I think is that we need to assess the possibility of two options when it comes to how the war could possibly end. I would say that the preferred option, of course, is that Russia will be leaving, for some reason, what we call internationally recognized Ukrainian territory. It doesn't necessarily mean that we will have peace after that, but it would be a kind of uh, uh, not an unprecedented war. Unfortunately, uh, the other scenario, which I consider to be at least as likely, is that we will end up with an open-ended war in um, in Europe, and what do I mean by that? Basically, that Russia will be, for the foreseeable future, occupying some areas of Ukraine that's not very different from what they occupy today. And uh, we will be uh, living with a situation where it's an ongoing war in a part of Europe. And of course, we haven't actually discussed this. And then, uh, and when people ask me how I want the war to end, one thing is how the war is ending. But we also need to understand that there must be some arrangement that will not give Ukraine a higher geopolitical risk than the rest of Europe. Because if you are thinking about reconstruction and everything, uh, investments and so forth, there must be some credible deterrence against Russia doing the same in five years' time. Otherwise, they will not be flowing money into Ukraine to reconstruct and rebuild the country. Mm. And those kind of discussions we will need, need to have. 
So if one thing is ending the war, the next big issue is how to deter Russia from repeating what they just mm -hmm. did. And if that's not going to happen, Russia would basically have the ability to keep Ukraine unstable for the foreseeable future. So uh, those issues really need to be uh, looked into, and um, I'm much happy to return to it, but I'm not going to occupy more of over mm -hmm. time right mm -hmm. now, but it's of immense importance to discuss what so, if Russia is leaving, it doesn't necessarily bring us peace. Mm -hmm. Russia will need to be deterred for decades, most likely. And we also talk about a post-Putin regime that we may deal with. I say that we are probably not very much helped by one dictator being replaced by another one. Uh, I took great interest in reading uh, the article Navalny wrote in Washington Post in uh, late September. And they said the strategic victory is Russia becoming a democracy. Only Russia as a democracy will give the possibility of security, real security and real peace for its neighbors and for Europe. So what we need is not a post-Putin regime, we need a post-totalitarian Russia. That's the kind of Russia we can start to integrate into the civilization again. I know it was a long answer, but <laughs> yeah, well, I'm kind of emotional about these issues. <laughs> yeah, well, this was um, certainly the, the, the larger picture mm. uh, and the long-term picture because it's, uh, you know, the assumption we must work on, I think, is that this is not going to happen uh, very quickly, if mm. ever at all. Uh, and a problem with, uh, with our analysis is, of course, that uh, we, make, we have to make assumptions. Uh, they have to be as solid as possible. But as Clint Eastwood said, assumption is the mother of all fuck-ups. <laughs> so we have to be very careful about uh, which assumptions we work on. Uh, and I think it is, uh, we heard uh, the in interventions on the Arctic, the increased importance of the Arctic, uh, and clearly there ha something has to be done, as Vladimir <laughs> Lenin said, but what is to be done? I think we, we suffer from a problem of reactivity, that uh, since it's so difficult to make these assumptions and it's difficult to take risk in doing something, it's much easier to stay with the status quo. We can talk more about that, but uh, Ian, some comments on strategy or the lack thereof. I, I think, yeah, the lack thereof is, is the concern. You know, I haven't heard a good discussion about what winning looks like for Ukraine, other than from Ukrainians themselves. And clearly they would like to take back Crimea, and I think that's a, a goal we should all support as wholeheartedly as we can. But I, I have a feeling it's a discussion that not many people in NATO or the West want to have publicly. And, and this, is, this is quite problematic uh, for all of us. And Arne talks about you know, what kind of Russia will happen after. But surely we should first talk about how do we punish Russia for this once they are beaten? You know, so like, we have to look at what defeat mechanisms exist for Russia. How does this look? Will the military disintegrate? Will they just be forced out? And what happens next? And I don't think these discussions are happening, certainly not, not in public yet. And I know Crimea has also, or Ukraine has also asked for reparations, and what does that look like? So I think that there is, uh, there is, there is a lot of issues that, that I hope are being discussed behind closed doors. My fear is they're probably not being discussed too closely behind closed doors. And the problem is, as, as the other two say, speakers have said, this is probably going to last quite a long time. And I'm not sure, it's not about Western will or commitment, it's Western resources. Mm -hmm. And how much more we have to give is, is a big question. So, for example, the Danes have donated artillery pieces that they haven't even had delivered to themselves yet, mm -hmm. right? You know, so this is, this is a significant question for NATO about, you know, how much force can we give without weakening our own deterrent capability. So, yeah, I, I'm, uh, I'm concerned about a lack of strategy, let's put it that way. Yes, uh, certainly industrial production mm -hmm. uh, is not, it's not happening mm -hmm. in the West yet, although there is an increase in artillery production and so on. But this is something that requires a different mentality and different will mm -hmm. to stay in this game. Asla? Well, I'll just have to echo what the previous speakers have been saying. The challenge here 
is that for the Western powers, we will not allow Russia to get out of this with anything resembling a victory. Mm -hmm. that, is, uh, that, that is our agreed position. Our preferred uh, means of denying Russia victory has been economic sanctions. And we have to be honest, after a year of sanctions, it does not look like they work well enough <laughs> to bring the war to an end. And they do not work well enough to deprive Russia from the capacity to, for offensive operations, which was a further goal. Ukraine is in a very difficult situation here. Uh, one, uh, there is a lack of comprehension in Western countries of the scale of combat taking place here. This is not Afghanistan. It's mm -hmm. not one of the savage wars of peace. It's a, it's a front line that stretches for hundreds of kilometers uh, with hundreds of thousands of troops deployed, enormous of um, uh, amounts of munitions being expended, and it's expensive. It's expensive to wage industrial wars. This is arguably the first truly industrial war we have seen since World War II. And um, right now, the Americans are footing about two-thirds of the bill. We're paying both for the budgets uh, for, for Ukraine, a country where economic activities have, uh, have shrunk. Uh, we're paying for the actual war fighting. Uh, and our position is one that uh, Russia will not accept at the current moment. I think that's quite unlikely that the Russians are going to say, all right, fair cop, uh, well, we tried it out, uh, we'll pull back and we'll keep a sliver of, uh, of Donetsk uh, and Crimea, and uh, let's, uh, let's argue about this in some other way. I think it's most likely that both parties will try to decide this on the battleground, for the, China, for the Ukrainians, it's a desperate situation because they're so dependent on progress and victories in order to get more support. Uh, I don't mm -hmm. envy Zelensky one moment his job, fighting for his life, fighting for the independence of, uh, of his country, and at the same time knowing that if the Ukrainians lose, then the willingness to support them might mm -hmm. uh, well, decline in, uh, in Western countries. I don't really see any solution for this in the short to medium term. When we look at, uh, at war studies, wars are usually uh, brought to an end by one of the parties winning. And I don't see victory for either of the parties in the short to medium term. Uh, the other option is for both parties to be so uh, bloodied and to be uh, so, uh, uh, having suffered so much blood loss that they don't have any other option than to look uh, for, for a way out. Unfortunately, uh, as, uh, as my uh, other panelists have pointed out, right now it might look like a frozen conflict might be uh, the result. Mm -hmm. Of course, we will have to see uh, what is going to happen in 23. It's going to be likely one big Russian offensive and one likely one big Ru Ukrainian offensive. We will know more after that. But being uh, sober, and I hear this in Washington as well, uh, there are doubts about whether the Ukrainians will be able to throw the Russians out militarily. Uh, and also there are concerns in DC that that is not really a question about how many Abrams tanks are given to the Ukrainians. It's on a different scale. And that scale is one that the West is not really willing to compete in, to uh, a full mobilization warfare uh, with the aim of defeating Russian, uh, Russian conventional forces in the field. And that has much to do with the fear of uh, this, go this whole thing going nuclear. Yes. One more, yeah, yeah, sorry. No, no, I think this is, uh, this is the core of the, of the problem because the, um, you know, we, we don't own this war, we don't want to own this war, yet we <laughs> own it and want to own it. It's the sort of, we don't want to be, um, have skin in this game, yet we, we think we must have because they should win. So it's, this, it's a sort of, maybe indecision, uh, because if there is no real risk of escalation conventionally, very little risk of escalation in terms of nuclear, uh, why the reticence? Uh, and I think the, timing fa the time factor we haven't uh, touched on, but if it is true that the time factor is essential, then there ought to be a Ukrainian offensive before a Russian one is possible. But the tanks issue, training, getting ready, two, three months at least 
for the leopards. So there's something very um, disconcerting about the, the Western, should one say, even pol policy maybe on this issue that uh, uh, one doesn't really want to, to go all in, yet one has uh, uh, sort of uh, dreams about being able to do so. Uh, so it may en end with a frozen, indecisive situation, much like the status quo ante, uh, at which point NATO and the West will still have to deter Russia to a greater extent than had Ukraine won. Uh, and that brings me to the Arctic uh, the interventions, uh, because we're covering everything in this panel. Uh, and I wrote, when I took notes here on your interventions, uh, what should be done uh, again, we analyzed the situation, we said the Kola Peninsula, the Co not the peninsula, but the bases are going to become more important to Russia. That's a very clear conclusion. So what is to be done uh, on NATO's side? You said, Ian, that NATO is not the maritime actor, uh, not the sea power actor that is ideal, because it's coalitions of the able and, and, and like-minded states. Uh, and, and the new technology means that you have to have a jointness uh, that is unprecedented and it's not achieved through 32 countries agreeing to share intelligence and so on. So uh, Norway being in the middle of this geographically, um, should, if we were to do something actually, not only analyze the situation, what should we do? Should Norway sort of look to Britain as the leader, uh, Jeff as the means, as a sort of model of coalition. Um, should one be more present in the, in the Arctic? We also, we know that ships uh, do sink. We just had the experience <laughs> of sinking a frigate, um, quite easily done, in fact. So uh, what strategic, what strategic uh, uh, lesson or implication uh, derives from your analysis? You could do a round of this. Asler doesn't have to because he is not speaking on, on the Arctic, but you are free to do so as well. Lars. Well, thank you. Um, uh, the role of intelligence is, of course, to describe the problem and then leave it to my masters to deal exactly. with the problem. So uh, I won't go into making policy proposals here, but I think uh, Norway is uniquely situated to be the eyes and ears of NATO up north and continuing to do that mission and, um, and being able to do it even better in the future is, is critically important. Uh, the North, Northern Fleet is the most important uh, fleet in Russia. Um, it is where most of their new weaponry is tested. So um, having a, a strong intelligence presence in the Barents Sea is, is, will remain critical there. I just managed to sell the importance of uh, the Norwegian Intelligence Service um, in my answer. But, but when it comes to policy um, uh, proposals, I will leave it to the distinguished gentleman on my right. Mm -hmm. The main th idea is, of course, that deterrence, if deterrence works, it means that you influence the adversary through deterrence. So the question is really, how can one deter uh, in a more uh, forceful way uh, in order to achieve the, the results we want um, than a low-tension Arctic. Yes, Arne? Well, I'm, I'm not so sure if the low-tension Arctic actually should be a political objective or not. Uh, I think that to preserve Norwegian territory should be uh, the main political uh, objective. And if we should draw one overarching conclusion from what we have seen lately in Europe, the conclusion is that in Europe there is no security whatsoever beyond NATO's borders. And that mm -hmm. was the conclusion in Finland. I'm sure they mm -hmm. basically said that, we join NATO. And uh, the way I view it is that some long-term trends are pushing, in a way, uh, the future naval capacity of, uh, of Russia to actually the Kola Peninsula. In my intervention, I mentioned the new NATO lake, mm -hmm. the Baltic. I mentioned uh, the Black Sea. Mm -hmm. It's not as available as it was, and nobody actually knows the end of the Crimea yet. And also, Russia will be more challenged in Asia. 
due to uh, Japanese uh, uh, rearmament. So there is, over time, a push towards, uh, towards uh, Russia and, uh, and also uh, to focus on, uh, on the Kola Peninsula, because the other options are actually guessing, getting less and less important. And uh, also, I very much agree with what you said, uh, Austin, that Russia is a declining power. And I mean, it's a power with a strategic situation that is much weaker than it was a year ago. And also, it's a power with an economy that is much, much weaker than it was a year ago. So it is a power that has imposed on itself a lot of constraints. And uh, of course, now, after having got Finland and I think they will, as a part of NATO. We should take action, and I think we are doing already, actually, as we speak, to see the defense of the area north of uh, the, the polar circle as a NATO operation. We in Norway need to stop talking about how Norway should defend Finnmark. We need to talk about how Sweden, Finland, and Norway will defend its territory north of mm -hmm. the Arctic Circle. That's basically the, uh, the issue. And that will have to happen inside a NATO framework. And uh, as we speak, I know that there is planning ongoing among the military, which headquarters should be doing what and so on and so on. But it's important this change of attitude from being three different countries to being one area with basically no borders. And that's where we should start when we look at uh, how to deal with uh, protecting our territory uh, up north. We cannot do that without a view to what the Finns are doing, what the Swedes are doing. And it's not a secret that I think we could benefit from multinational forces up in the northern part of our country. Mm -hmm. I leave it there. Yeah, clearly the Norwegian uh, old balance of, uh, of uh, uh, you know, of, of what we call it, the roligels, so what's that in English? Um, uh, reassurance? Reassurance, yes, reassurance. Yes. I mean, I, I, who, I really don't see that Putin who, needs who, more exactly. reassurance right now. It's probably, <laughs> we, we need the reassurance in these times. <laughs> so clearly the, this is a major shift in Norwegian uh, security and defense thinking, uh, which is now probably dawning on the, on the community doing these things. But Ian, uh, how should one uh, be proactive, uh, as they say in business circles? So I think, you know, for a long time, we, we have failed to present enough dilemmas to Russia to deal with. And I think this is what needs to change a little bit. And, and we don't need to look you know, to develop something new, we can, I think we can look to the past. And, and like the new maritime strategy of the 1980s from the US, you know, brought in US forward uh, forces, naval forces primarily, but also to a, uh, to a degree air forces quite high north. And the objective there was to, through the exercises to test the strategy was to continually pose new dilemmas to, to the Soviet Union and their naval forces. And, and I can't help wonder why we are not going back to that style of operation where we are, NATO is highly visible to a much greater degree. And yes, US forces are not available as much as they are, but we do have the UK and, and, and the French who, uh, who could take the lead mm -hmm. and, and create significant levels of force uh, in the high north and, and, and demonstrate to Russia that they, they, need to, like, they need to be forced to change their way of operations instead of us continuously adjusting to that. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you very much. Asla, uh, do you have a comment on this? Well, I think uh, if, if uh, I may come with two suggestions now that the best suggestion has already been, uh, <laughs> been made, and that is that we need to build a northern dimension to NATO mm -hmm. now that that is possible, mm -hmm. first time since 1949. Uh, Second, uh, you know, this sort of potluck wars where everybody sort of rummage through their cabinets and find whatever, you know, that they're not using and then, you know, yeah. like pooling it. That's not a way to, work, to fight wars. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. We need to build up the industrial capacity for high-intensity warfare. It's only two countries that have 
gotten that message, the French and the Americans that are putting up all new, uh, uh, new, uh, new production lines. Mm -hmm. And in this country, the government has really missed the ball when it comes to requests from, um, from our, uh, arms, uh, our uh, ammunition manufacturers at the Raifoss, where the government are now quarrelling about who's going to foot the bill for the expansion of production capacity, which is in our core national, uh, our core national interest. So we need, we need to be able to fight wars. And okay. the second is, what I mentioned in my, in my comments, I think that we might, uh, you know, and we, maybe this, uh, the academicians amongst us may play a role in this, we need to take turns with what just happened, the savage, savage wars of peace. All the ideas we came up with to allow ourselves to invade countries without a UN mandate, we need to owe up to that that wasn't how the Western countries will be going uh, and behaving. In the, in the world going forwards. Only 6.4% of the world's population are currently living in full-scale democracies. We just have to get used to living in a world where there are authoritarian states, totalitarian states, uh, countries that are not democracies, and we need to deal with them in another way than uh, with the threat of invasion for some reason or another. That is the only way that we're going to win, to build the sort of coalition that is going to be required to confront the great authoritarian powers and the new duopoly between Russia and China. Yes, yeah, certainly one hasn't, uh, if we don't have the power to preach, to sort of walk the walk, the talking is not much use. Uh, we have uh, remaining eight minutes and uh, I want to pose the last question regarding what Andrew Michta is asking here, uh, posing a question about um, domestic politics support for the um, F war, for the war effort uh, and weapons delivery to Ukraine and this engagement that the West now is in, uh, we still have uh, some sort of unity, although Germany had a stumble there uh, a week ago uh, and has been reluctant. And this has to do with taking risk, this skin in the game uh, issue. Uh, strategic cultures exist in some states and not in others, Germany being the foremost example where it doesn't, or they used it all up in World War II to be facetious. But I have a suggestion then that um, one certainty is that the US is now uh, shouldering the burden here with 90% of weapons delivery. That will not continue in, et in eternity, it won't continue uh, for years on end, although there's still support very much, I think, in, in the US for this, bipartisan support. Uh, but Europe will have to do much more regarding Ukraine, uh, reconstruction, um, uh, maybe security. Um, it is a regional European issue. Russia is an acute problem, says the US security strategy. Uh, and I have the hope that France may become more important uh, in the leading uh, duo with the UK in Europe again, given the events that have happened. We heard from Camille Grand yesterday that French policy is changing, there's more support for the Ukraine war effort. France sees that uh, there is no hope in a strategic autonomy duo in the EU with Germany after this latest uh, um, problem with the tanks. And France has an excellent strategic culture, has its own domestic production, could offer Mirage planes uh, to Ukraine uh, without any problem. Uh, so I would like to hear your sort of thinking on this, Europe being then, when Europe has to be a key actor now, and the US says with good reason, it is up to you Europeans now to shoulder much more of the burden. How might that security architecture look? Am I wrong in hoping for the return of the French-British leadership in Europe? Uh, you yes, want to start? Yes. This is the last round. You yes, know. Yeah, yes, you are, yes, you are wrong. Uh, <laughs> I think that the, like, the likelihood of uh, Anglo-French uh, core of uh, defence in Europe evaporated with Brexit. I think it's going to be very difficult. Uh, not long ago, a, a member of somebody who works at the Elysee Palace uh, made a comment about the war in Ukraine, asserting that uh, the, the fear of post-coital regret on behalf of the Americans. And the French argument was, look at Bosnia, 
Look at Iraq, look at Afghanistan. How often do you see the American president ever refer to any of these countries? They never talk about them. And so the Americans have a tendency to be completely engaged until they're completely disengaged. Uh, and uh, for, from a French point of view, I think the French are more eager to, to make this war end through negotiation uh, than, than other powers. And that might have something to do with what you said, that this will remain a European issue and that they would like to have a peace that sticks. Right now, the, the Germans are quite dependent on the French for strategic culture. You are, you're right about mm -hmm. that. But the French have found it very difficult to find any resonance for their views in Washington. And as I said in my comments, the alliance is now thoroughly American-led. And mm -hmm. so without the Americans on board, there is not going to be any rival policies in NATO. Uh, that might change with the development of the war. But right now, the French look slightly isolated, I would say. Mm -hmm. Ian? Yeah, I have to agree. I, I think that the, the effect of Brexit in the UK and, and in France is, has, has, has made that kind of leadership impossible, certainly as long as the, the Conservative government are in power. But I think in general, uh, you know, yes, US is, is, NATO is now a US-dominated alliance to a, a point we've probably never seen before, and the EU doesn't really know how to, to, to activate its own power in any real way because there's no one leading it. But I was at a, a, a workshop or a conference a, a few months ago where a, an a, a academic and policymaker from Asia was giving a presentation and he said that Europeans need to give up their comfy social democratic lifestyle because the real world will interfere with it from now on. And I think we need politicians across Europe to, to, to begin to, 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 to emphasize that uh, maybe where, where we have been for the last 10, 15 years is not a sustainable future when mm -hmm. Russia is acting as it is. So I'm not very optimistic on yeah. that. But. In addition, we are leaderless then. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no. Well, I'm, uh, of course, the, the main problem, I, I mean, it's not entirely true that France and Germany, I mean, they have put a lot of uh, effort into supporting Ukraine. Uh, for some reason, when the Chancellor or <laughs> President Macron say something, they phrase things in such a way that they don't really get credit for what they have done, because they have delivered quite a bit of weapons. But the way they phrase it, it doesn't sound good. We all know that. <laughs> and, uh, and I was very happy when I listened to the Prime Minister yesterday. I said that uh, after that speech yesterday, I could hear the Prime Minister use, he used words that actually described the seriousness of the situation how sincere the situation is. It was not a mismatch between the words he used and our perception of the situation, pretty much aligned. And, uh, and that, that's been a problem with, uh, with Germany and, and France, because they had the opportunity almost a year ago to actually change the uh, political thinking about German and French leadership in Europe. We heard the word Seitenwende, it was talked about yesterday, but the impression is that it really doesn't happen. And Macron was the last leader, so to speak, that flew and tried to reach out to Putin and so on and so on. So the reality now is that Berlin and Paris, if you look to all the Eastern countries, they are not at all perceived to be credible. That, that's the reality. The only country left in Europe, and it's not on the continent, that is viewed as credible, seen from Eastern Europe, is the UK. And beyond that, the United States. All the others are not viewed with sufficient credibility to take upon themselves any kind of leadership role in a European perspective. That's where I think we are, uh, are right now. Yeah, so maybe it will be Poland ascending, but uh, last Poland, you, um, you have the last <laughs> word. <laughs> also some, some problems related to it. <laughs> no, I mean, you can always say that Europe should do more, and I'm sure Europe will do more, but I, I think from seen from Russia, the resolve of Europe in this crisis has been tremendous. It's been shocking to Russia, the, mm -hmm. the, the amount of support. And I think, um, not to be quoted, but 
it has been also a calibrated support. If you are going to, uh, to kill a frog, you need to uh, increase the temperature gradually and not um, drop it in boiling water. So the weaponry has um, become more advanced. Um, as Oslo was mentioning, the, the quality of Western weapons is uh, far more superior than anything uh, Russia has. But I think uh, what also Ukraine has shown is the importance of volume, because the, the amount of munitions spent is uh, mm -hmm. We haven't seen anything like it since World War II. So mm. it's um, volume is, is critical. That would be sound advice, I think, for, for Western defense planning. Okay, so I gather that the conclusion here is that the glass is half full and not half empty, or maybe become even fuller or filled. <laughs> so I'm filled with optimism after this, then. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you so much, Janne, for making a great closing debate. A great closing debate out of four very interesting interventions. Thank you to the panel. And so, friends, time is up. That was the end of Leoncon Security Conference 2023. I would once more like to thank all the speakers and moderators for sharing your knowledge, engaging in a free and open debate. That's what the transatlantic family is about. We are here to discuss and debate and support each other. Please follow the Atlantic Committee on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and other so me platforms. Uh, you might also tune in and look at this conference again, because you will find it on our website. This has been two intense and interesting days for us in the committee, and uh, I would like to thank my crew. I would like them to come up here. Uh, Henrik Anders, and not to forget Camilla, who has been in charge of the planning and implementing this conference together with me. Please come up here to the scene. And also all the volunteers. We have some volunteers from Yata and even from my family, my daughter, <laughs> uh, who has been behind the scene taking care of all the nitty gritties of conference making. And also, thank you to Flowworks, uh, the company, the two guys who has helped us with the technology and the sound, which was needed because <laughs> you made it uh, a bit difficult for yourself. So, uh, please, I think we should give them all a big hand, and thank you for the audience for coming. <laughs>